It's the first question that most kids ask. It's the question that adults ask more than anything else. And it's the question that is probably hardest to answer. It's the why questions. Uh, we're going to have a, a little look at just scratching the surface of some of the why questions, the, those big questions, uh, using the, uh, the text that Steve has just read for us. Here's a question. Why do I have to go through dark times? I'd rather life be happy, thank you very much. Why on earth do I have to go through these dark times, the hard times, the tough times? Let's not start with us. Let's start back in our text. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. Now, let's just deal with the darkness that happened there. Often it's thought, oh, that must have been an eclipse. So uh, let's deal with that, and I can tell you, no, it wasn't an eclipse. And this is why. You are now about here. An eclipse is all about the way the moon orbits around the Earth. Uh, when the, the moon is between the sun and the Earth, that's when you get a new moon. But when the, the moon orbits around to be the far side... The, we can see the, the sun shining on the full face of the moon. That's when you get a full moon. In, in the new moon, all we can see is the shadow because the light's always on the one side. You get that? And with the Jewish calendar, the, they, they didn't have the advantage of 30 days as September. They, they, they were stuck with using the moon. And when they could see the first sliver of a waxing crescent. That was the first day of the month. Now, it, it takes 28 days for the moon to orbit around. And so on the 14th day of the month, you always got the full moon. The Passover always fell on, guess what day? The 14th day of the first month of their year. So Passover always happened on the day of the full moon, the night of the full moon. Do you know what day Jesus was crucified? Actually, it was the 13th day. It was, it was, the, it was Passover Eve. So as he was being sealed in the tomb, the sun was setting over the eastern horizon and the full moon was rising over the western, over the eastern horizon, uh, marking the 14th day of the month. Now, why is that of any interest, apart from us galahs who get all excited by these things? Well, the answer is all about eclipses. You can only have an eclipse during a new moon. And you know why? Because an eclipse is where you get this tiny, relatively tiny, area of shadow from the moon shining onto the earth. And it can only happen in a period of a new moon. You couldn't possibly have it happen when there's a full moon. So you could not possibly have an eclipse at the time anywhere near the Passover. So the darkness that came over the earth while Jesus was on the cross could not possibly have been an eclipse. It was, a, it was yeah, half a month out of cycle for there to be. Plus, uh, an eclipse lasts about three minutes. The darkness lasted three hours. So once again, that's something else that says it could not possibly have happened. Now, Mary's running off with quite a rush. Would someone like to just run after her? A phone. Okay, thank you. As long as everything's fine. Oh, and just to mark in your diaries, the, the, the next eclipse that we are going to get, you know, they happen in different... Because the, uh, all orbits are ellipses, not 
perfect circles. It happens at different times, different places. Just jot that in your diary. 22nd of July uh, in what, nine years. We're almost there. Now, th that's all very well and good for way back then. That was 2,000 years ago. Why do I have to go through dark times and not just eclipses is what we're talking about? Uh, there, there's lots of reasons why. And here's just one glimpse. And all, all we've got time to do is just scratch the surface of this. So this text says, You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. I live as children of light. So that tells us, first of all, that why am I going through dark times? One of the reasons is for me to realise where the darkness is. It, it's not just out there. It's not just someone else's fault. It's not just circumstances. It's not just the politicians, no matter who you voted for yesterday. It, it's not just the annoying people you have to live with. It's not just the strange relatives. Where's the darkness? Talking to Christians, he says, you were once that darkness. Until you know I'm part of the problem, you cannot be part of the solution. You've got to name it. And so that's why the other half is, now you are light. You were once darkness. You were once part of the problem. But now you are light. You are the light of the world. You are God at work. You, it's not just God in you, but you are that light. You are God's light to the world. Now you are light as long as you're in the Lord. And we need to make use of that light. Which is why the verse ends by saying, do it. Live it out. Live as children of light. You are no longer darkness. Don't live like that. Change. Step over the line. Be different. Be who you are as the light. And don't worry about, oh, the darkness out there. It's someone else's. I'm the light. I'm carrying the light within me. I'm the shining one. It doesn't matter if there's dark all around. You are the light. Everywhere you go, in every possible circumstance. Here's another why question. Why do I have to call out to God again and again? If God knows everything, by the way, that's, that's a rhetorical question. Yeah. Since God knows everything, why do I have to keep on coming back and saying the same prayer over and over again? Doesn't he hear the first time? Doesn't he? Yes, he does, of course. So what's the point of saying the same thing over and over? And here it is, demonstrated by Jesus on the cross. He says, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Part of the answer is you've got the Trinity at work here. My God, the Father, my God, the Son, why have you forsaken me? God, God, sorry, God the Father, God the Spirit, and why have you forsaken me? God the Son. So here they're all tied in together. But there's more than that. There's wherever you get a repetition in Scripture, it's always an emphasis. My God. You are my God. So Jesus is hanging on here. Won't go through the whole thing, but Jesus at one time told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and not give up. The same thing again and again. The, the parable was the, the woman who kept on annoying the, the judge who would not deliver justice. And so she kept on and on and on the way that you have to do with politicians until she finally got what she wanted. 
Why? First of all, persistence, my persistence, gives me dedication. By coming back and having to redo that same prayer, I, I'm forced to ask, is this what I really need? You can start off with, is it what I really want? Well, yeah, of course, it's what I want. I want, I want the easy stuff. But what do I really need? And as I'm forced to come back and revisit that same prayer, that same problem, that same question, I'm forced to ask, is it what I really want? Is it what I really need? Is it what God really wants for me to have? And turn the whole thing around. And you know, sometimes it just takes time for me to wrestle with those serious questions. And so part of that is you have to ask again and again. Another thing is that persistence not only gives me dedication, it gives me direction. I'm praying for this, I'm praying for this, I'm praying for this. Should I be praying for this? Is that the right thing to pray? Is this the direction that I want to go? Is it the direction that God wants my life to go? And so again, by having to wrestle with the seemingly non-answer, that I have to keep on, not just saying, gimme, 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 but why am I praying this prayer? What is it that I expect, want and need? And what's God's place in all of this other than to be a sugar daddy? Now, this is not news. You saw, you saw um, this next little clip uh, nearly six months ago about here's some ways where, where you pray. You start off at the shallow end of the pool. The, this is not good praying. This is not serious praying. I, I, I ask for something. If I got what I wanted, I think, oh, God answered my prayer. If I didn't get what I wanted, well, God didn't answer my prayer. Now, that's, that's completely wrong, but it's a starting point. You can do better than that. So let's ramp it up a bit. If I prayed that prayer and I got what I wanted, then I can say, ah, God answered my prayer. Yes, he always answers prayer, but this time he answered with a yes to what I was asking. If I didn't get what I wanted, then God answered my prayer with no. And that, that's okay. Yes or, yes or no. Yeah, we're starting to get the hang of praying and God answering. But let's ramp it up again. I got what I wanted. So yes, the answer is yes. I didn't get what I wanted. So God's answer was, well, he might have said no, but he might also have said wait. Because patience is so good for us, isn't it? <laughs> it must be. We get so much of a, an opportunity to practice it. And, you know, sometimes just circumstances aren't right because I pray in my little bubble about my issues, but I'm praying for more than just me. And so some, somewhere outside my bubble, other circumstances need to come into play in order for that prayer about me to be answered. So there's got to be that connection and so sometimes it just takes time and I have to wait sometimes the problem's not out there guess where it is yeah you're all pointing at me yeah <laughs> and rightly so because sometimes it's not the circumstances that have to change sometimes it's me that has to change so that I'm ready to receive God's answer let's ramp it up again It's there, it's there, it's there. I got what I wanted. God answered my prayer with a yes. Good. I didn't got, get what I wanted. And so the answer really wasn't no or wait. Chances are it was God saying, 
I've actually got something better than you've been praying about. You know, I've been praying for... Don't let anyone know, particularly don't let the uh, church council know this. I, I've been hankering after and praying, oh Lord, please give me an Aston Martin. I think God might have said no. Tell the evangelists get all sorts of stuff. He might have said wait. He might have just rolled on the floor laughing, thinking, are you kidding me? He might have said, I've got something better. And I think that's mostly the prayers, the, the answer to the prayers we get. Because in our little bubble, we see such a small, narrow viewpoint. But as we keep on coming back and testing that prayer, is this the prayer that God wants me to pray? Then chances are, I'm going to be redirected and, and reword, reframe even, what I'm praying so that I get a prayer that's better. I can ramp it up again. So instead of telling God what to do and how to do it, and quite frankly, that's what most of our prayers are. Just don't read on for a sec, just, just bear with me. A, a survey was done of Christians, where they pray and what they pray about. Where most Christians pray, have a guess. Where do most Christians pray? In bed, <laughs> in church, bed, bed. In the, actually it's in the car. Most Christians pray in the car. Do you know what they pray about more than anything else? Parking spots. I'm serious. What sort of prayer life, what sort of spiritual life are we producing when our highest need is a convenient parking spot? I think God hears that prayer. He looks at your waistline and he says, the ideal parking spot for you is a long way away from where you want to go because you need the exercise. And what thanks does he get for answering our prayer like that? Anyway, I, I digress. So instead of telling God what to do and how to do it and where the parking spot should be, I started telling God why I am praying. Now here we are back to the why question. That's the important bit. Why am I praying this? And what are the consequences that I expect to come if I get a yet answer? to that prayer allowing him to manage my circumstances and bring about the outcome in his way so the best answer you can get is not yes no wait or anything else but I think the very best answer we can ever get to our prayers is let's go through this together and, and that brings us around to our text. Does God ever forsake us? We'll come to that in a sec. So our final question is, why do I keep losing God? Why do I keep... <laughs> He's a big God, must be hard to lose, hard to misplace... So where is God when I need him most? Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if we're going to understand what he's really saying here, Again, don't let the church council know this because it sounds a bit like heresy. We're, we're not going to start in the Bible. We're going to start in the dictionary to work out what on earth the word forsaken means. 
well, actually, we're going to go back to the, uh, the Bible, because the original word for forsaken and catal uh, lupo, and catal, th that's close enough. Helen will forgive me, I'm sure. It's actually a compound word, and it's made up of three words. The word in, plus down, plus leave. And that's the word that is translated into English as forsaken. Now, can you work out why in, plus down, plus leave, would give us forsaken in English? It means to be in a down condition and left there. That's how they get it. To leave in a condition of lack, to be in dire circumstances, to be left without support, to be helpless. And can you see how that's why we've got so many different translations into English? Because they've taken this one word, unpronounceable foreign word, and then tried to give the sense in English. And so we've got lots and lots of different translations. And all of them are helpful. Uh, and that's why Bible said it's, it's good to have different versions because they give a slightly different perspective on things. So my translation is when Jesus says, why have you forsaken me? He's asking, why have you left me in this dreadful position? My God the Father, my God the Spirit, why have you, you left me down here in such a horrible place, is what he's saying. Now, are you familiar with the TV program Mythbusters? They take interesting ideas. Now, is this really true or is it a myth? And they, they test it, usually with explosives, which is why boys like the, the show. Yeah. So we're going to give the Mythbusters this question to test for us. Uh, the why have you forsaken me? So the first myth is that Jesus was saying, life sucks. This is a really bad position to be in. I hate being crucified. It hurts. And I'm not feeling very happy about it. What do you think? In his humanity, would he have felt uh, forsaken? Well, duh, yeah. If, imagine yourself on a cross. Imagine being crucified. Of course it was miserable circumstance. Naturally, his humanity did feel terrible. But here is a famous illustration that you must never forget because it's just so helpful and comes uh, into its own so many times. It doesn't matter what I'm feeling. The driver of everything really is facts. And then my connection with facts, particularly facts that, I, that are not tangible sorts of facts, uh, historic facts, is my faith. I know it to be true because it's reliably reported. And then how I feel about it is just the caboose being dragged along. You cannot put the caboose up the front as the driver. That will never work. That often happens, but it produces messy results. So, Jesus' humanity felt forsaken? Well, yes, it's quite plausible, but for the myths busters, busted. That's not what it was about. Jesus did not say, I'm having a bad day and I feel forsaken. It was not about his feelings. He was dealing with facts. So, let's try another myth. Jesus' humanity wanted answers growing up. Why? God, why is this happening? Why do I have to go through such a terrible thing as this? Why? Back to our why question all over again. Well, there's a plan. There was always a plan. Even before Jesus began his ministry, here we are, John chapter 1. 
John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you know how lambs in the Old Testament took away sin? <laughs> they were sacrificed. That was the plan. Jesus was the Lamb to be sacrificed. Uh, go on right into the very beginning of his ministry. Here we are in John chapter 2. Jesus said of himself, destroy this temple. And it goes on to say the temple is his body. Destroy this body and in three days I will raise it again. He was going to bring himself back after three days of being dead because that was the plan. He knew that right from the beginning of his ministry. He goes on a little bit further. And again, he uses a different illustration, but the same idea, the same plan. Three days and three nights, dead and buried. But only that limited time. He would die and he would come back again. Here is a key verse right in the centre of the Gospels. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That was the plan. He knew the plan. He spelt out the plan. Jesus began to show his disciples. So he, he's giving some really intense uh, teaching here that he has to be killed and raised again. And again, talking with his disciples. He has authority to lay down his life and he has the authority to take it back again. Did he know what the plan was? Of course he did. He's telling everybody what the plan was. Even his enemies knew his plan. His opponents knew what the plan was. Even when he was dead, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive, that, that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Everybody knew the plan. He was telling everybody. This is the plan. I am going to die and I'm going to rise again. And it's locked in place. He didn't have to ask, why is this happening to me? It was the plan that he knew all along. So doing some question and answer with Jesus, he, was, he didn't have to ask the question. He knew the answer. So if he's asking the question... It wasn't for him to find out the answer. Guess who had to know the answer? Go on, have a guess. It's up to us. He wants us to answer the question, why has God left him down in this terrible place? The why is for me to answer. I've got to wrestle. As I wrestle with prayer, I've got to come to grips with why is Jesus doing this? Why is this being done to him? Why is he going through this terrible, terrible experience? One of the songs we sing is Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. It's the, he is the answer and we're the ones who have got to wrestle with why is this happening to him? So, back to the, the myth busters. He wanted answers. They'd say busted. He didn't want answers. He knew the answers, but he wanted us to know why he was going through such a terrible experience. A final myth. This is a big one. You'll often come across this, and you might have wrestled with this yourself. What happened at the cross? Did Jesus, uh, did the Father turn his back on Jesus? Was Jesus separated from the other members of the Trinity? What, was he cut off from them? Was Jesus forsaken by the Father? The answer is very definitely yes. Yes, he was forsaken. Jesus cried, why have you forsaken me? He's dealing with facts. Yes, he was. But please, go back to our definition. What, what does it mean to be forsaken? To be left down in a dark place without assistance. In, down, left. And so Jesus was taken down into a dark place 
and left there without any assistance from God the Father or God the Spirit. The darkness closed in. Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer from heaven is absolute silence. There is no help. There is no dove that flutters down to give him assurance. There's no angels that come and minister to him. There, where are the, the 12 disciples? He is down in a dark place and left there. He bears the sin of the world all by himself. And no one comes to his aid, not even God the Father. It is such a horrible experience that he had no help. And as a human, a God who was human, he took all of humanity's sin. It must have been the most horrendous, awful experience beyond anything that humanity could imagine. And so, yes, the Father left Jesus alone to bear the full brunt of sin's penalty. That's what being forsaken means. It means Jesus took all your sin. He took all your guilt. He took all your punishment. And he wore it himself as painful and as hideous as that was. Was Jesus cut off? From the Father? Was he separated from the Father even in that three hours of darkness? And the answer is no. And he knew that he would not be because earlier on he'd warned his disciples, You will be scattered each to your own place and leave me all alone. Did they do that? Indeed they did. It had been predicted way back in the Psalms. But Jesus says, although you, my closest friends and disciples, will abandon me, notice the other half of what he says in this one verse. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. So although the Father was there, he lifted not a finger to help. He did not take any of the weight off Jesus, but allowed him to have all the punishment that all the world's sin could heap on him. And he took it all alone, which is why he is the only saviour that this world has. No one else has taken sin. Jesus has done it all and done it all alone. He alone is saviour. Maybe these two words will be a, a bit helpful. I, I find them a bit helpful. Fe fellowship. It's sort of like friendship. Yeah. That can be broken. Yeah, the closer the, the ties of fellowship, the harder they are to break. But it can be broken. Relationship can never be broken. The father never stopped being the father. The son never stopped being the son. Well, the, but because... What fellowship has light with darkness as Jesus took that darkness into himself? The fellowship was broken, but not the relationship. So what are the Mythbusters going to say about the father separating himself, abandoning him, walking away from Jesus, not looking at what was happening? Busted. And you see why? Let me tell you a story. I have a loving father, a, a dad. He has a son who is a sinner. One day, one of those sins was actually a crime. What did the loving father do with his sinning son? No, he didn't forgive him at all. Didn't take his punishment, no. He let the son take his punishment. The loving father marched his sinning son off to the police. 
and let the son bear the punishment. And isn't that what God has done? A loving father has handed his son over to punishment so the son can take all the punishment that's due and lift not a finger to help. That's what it is to be forsaken. Now, my dad's not the only one with a sinful son. If anyone does sin, we, Christians, have an advocate with the Father. Who is it? It is Jesus Christ, the righteous, the only one who can fit into that role. And why? Because he is the sacrifice. Not a sacrifice, not one of sacrifice, not a suitable sacrifice. He is the sacrifice, the one and only, the unique. He is the sacrifice that, the original word is, is the propitiation for our sins. The one who takes our sin and nullifies it, destroys it, pays the full penalty, takes it away, makes it evaporate, does it all. It was Jesus who deals with our sin fully and completely. So Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That forsaken is a very unusual word. It only occurs ten times in the entire Bible. And one of those other times is here. God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Now remember what forsake means? To leave without help down in a dark place. Doesn't mean you won't have dark times. Every one of you has. And there are more to come. But you will not go into that dark place alone. You will never go into a dark place without God being there with you, for you, and to provide his help to get you through that. Level 5 prayer. Let's go through this together. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the, the glorious promise that is so true. That you will never let us go into that dark place alone without your help. Wherever we go, you will go with us. Whatever it is we need to do, you will be there for us. Whatever it is that we need, you will provide for us. Thank you for such love that Jesus was forsaken to do with all our sin. But what a contrast that we will never be forsaken. And you have dealt with our sin and you help us to deal with our circumstances. So thank you for the glory of the cross and the glory of your presence. Through Jesus. Amen.